All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, worldwide, toll free 800 610 7035. Email Exxon at Exxon Radio TV dot com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And you can listen to us 724 365 at www.exxon dot com. My guest this hour is the one and only Howard Bloom, who is in the Big Apple. And Howard, how are you, my friend? Rob, you can actually hear me. Yeah. <laughs> we yes, we had technical difficulties, and I I was waiting for a call from Craig. Let me just plug the uh, the cord into this phone so that we don't run out of steam. Hang on. Sure, I knew a girl like that once. That's yeah. Oh. Here somewhere. Da, 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 okay, da. that's upside down. That's upside up. <laughs> Okay, now we're plugged in, and I'll take off the other headset. So how are you? It's a crazy mixed-up world out there right now. Well, you know what, buddy? I'm doing I'm doing great. Um, it's been one of those nights. We had uh, earlier tonight, as I was speaking to Marcy in Nevada, we were, we, we you know, it just cut the, the, the telephone line, and I figured, what the heck? Just to find out that an idiot down the road in the uh, in in the area of Hamilton where we are was using a backhoe and decided that he was going to do some ah. digging without checking oh. with the cable companies and the utilities. So Craig, amazing, us- yeah. So Craig, using his fast wooden it was actually able to reroute our phones and our Skype through one of our satellite providers until amazing, yeah. But that's how what kind of night it's been here. Uh, but you know what? The world has gone nuts. Well, it's gone nuts, but think of the positives of what you just explained to me. We have so many technological mm-hmm. possibilities at our disposal that even when somebody rips out a cable, we can find an alternative way to get through. Uh, I called you because I wasn't hearing from you on one phone option. I called you on another phone option, a different phone. Yeah. I mean, how many of us had a phone in our pocket um, on our belt uh, 20 years ago? How many of, many of us had access to satellites 30 years ago. Um, The number of solutions, I mean, I hate to say this because it doesn't make headlines, but the number of solutions is outpacing the number of problems, even though the problems are huge. I mean, the world demography is being ripped to shreds right now. There are 9 million refugees in Syria alone. And Europe at this point is taking in 535,000 refugees, half a million refugees a year which is an astonishing number. This is the biggest mass migration in the last hundred years of human history. Well, Howard, and why, why, don't, all, why yeah. don't they just solve the problem, get all the European countries to go in, kick the heck out of Bashad, give the people back to Syria? Well, I did a podcast over the weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a Howard the Humongous series running yep. on uh, YouTube, and it's got 13,200 subscribers. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, look, there is a solution to this. Um, the Saudis alone have increased the amount of land under cultivation between something like 1970 and 1990 from 400,000 acres to 8 million acres. Mm-hmm. That's using desalinated water. Right. They have a total of 36 government-owned desalination plants and 90 desalination plants in total. They have all the gas and all of the oil it takes to power more of these. One thing that Israel has learned, I mean, learn a lesson from Israel. Israel, beginning, um, we went in, we, because I'm a, a Zionist, atheist Jew, so I identify with Israel, we went into this horrid territory. It was desert and malarial swamp, and we drained the swamps, and we irrigated the desert, and we turned it into rich, rich agricultural territory, but we learned a lesson that nobody's articulated yet. It wasn't the farms. It wasn't the agriculture that really counted. Um, Even though uh, um, Sir Lawrence of Arabia 
took a look at what Israel was doing way, way back when and said, we need more of this. These people are turning this green. We sure. need this all over the Middle East. Well, he was right, but it wasn't the farms that were the secrets. It was the cities, Tel Aviv, Haifa, and the modern version of Jerusalem. Because in a city, you can house people, you can use a very much more limited amount of resources to house people, and when you house a bunch of people together, their creativity begins to flare. So what we really need are cities for these refugees. Now, the territory that Saudi Arabia possesses, just Saudi Arabia, one out of 57 Islamic countries, is twice the size of the United States. And most of it is uninhabited. And with desalination plants, they mm -hmm. could build cities. These Syrians, I don't know if you've seen the interviews on Al Jazeera where they're doing the most extensive interviews no, no, I with the refugees. Well, they're amazing. Now, first of all, you've got to realize these refugees are a small sample and an unrepresentative sample because the ones that Al Jazeera chooses to interview all speak English right, and speak it pretty well. So these are very sophisticated, very educated people. These are computer engineers. Um, these are people with very good educations. And they're looking for opportunities in Europe. But you know that someday there's going to be a culture clash. Yeah. Someday they are going to be going, begin longing for the Muslim culture or their children will begin longing for the Muslim culture. And some of them will long for the dark side of Muslim culture, jihadism, yeah. intolerance. Um, and that's a serious danger to Europe. But there are these huge spaces in Saudi Arabia, two nations alone, just two nations on the face of the planet are responsible for these 9 million Syrian refugees. They have turned these people into refugees. Those countries do not include the United States. We have stayed out of this. Um, Barack Obama makes many mistakes, but he has kept us out of this. Um, it's not Britain, it's not France, it's not Germany. Who are the two countries that are totally single-handedly responsible or double-handedly responsible for these refugees? It's Saudi Arabia and Iran who have been having a proxy war for nearly five years in Syria at the expense of the Syrian population. So who should be forced to bear the cost? Iran, for all of its cries of poverty, is an oil-rich nation. Saudi Arabia is the oil-richest nation on the face of the planet. They have the money with which to resettle these people. They not only have spare land, but between the two of them, those two countries have land that's the equivalent of 140 Israels. Wow. Now Israel has settled Israel has settled 5 million to 6 million Jewish refugees on a tiny little postage stamp of territory. What do you think that the Iranians and the Saudis could do with 140 times as much land and the wealth, you know, Israel's never right. had wealth. Um it's never had oil, it's never had gas. I mean now it's discovering gas for the first time. Um, but these countries are rich in resources, and they bear the total responsibility for these refugees. I don't want these refugees to be bounced around. These are human beings like you and me, and they deserve a decent life, and they deserve a life in which they don't think that any time in the next 20 minutes the shell is going to descend through their roof and blow themselves, mm -hmm. blow, blow them up, blow up their wives and their children. Nobody deserves to live like that. No, you, you, you're, you're right. You're right. Nobody deserves to live like that. However, I don't think that other countries should bear the brunt, the financial brunt, and the sociological brunt of, of, the, uh, of Saudi Arabia and Iran and what it's doing to these people. I agree with you, and that's why Saudi Ara yeah. uh, Arabia and Iran should be prevailed on to take up their responsibility, act like decent human beings, um, to, to, you know, when you, broke it, you break it, it's yours. Right. And they've broken it in Syria. I mean, they, the Iranians have broken it through their proxy army's very vigorous attempt to take over the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And they're also breaking it right now in Yemen um, because they want to take over the, the entire Middle East and be the power in the Middle East, and they want to be a superpower on a par at least with France, Germany, and England. And then later on, they want to be a superpower on, the par, par, on a par with the United States. Well, you don't have that right at the expense of 9 million people. I'm sorry. Um, you, if you if you have broken their lives, you have to mend them again. Um, that's what we did with the second at the end of the Second World War with yes. the Marshall Plan. We did it in both Europe and we did it in Japan, and it worked. So um, right now, the trick is for world leaders. Not that world leaders are going to listen to you and me, but the trick is for world leaders leaders to really prevail on Iran and Saudi Arabia to take in these refugees. You know, um, unfortunately. 
it looks totally unlike anybody's going to mm-hmm. prevail on them to do anything. You know, uh, we're, we're coming up to federal elections up here in Canada in uh, later on this fall, and uh, all the all the you know the 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 Prime Minister Harper and the two other party leaders that are running to get the seat in Ottawa are saying, well, we'll take in more, we'll take in more. And I, I, I just got so fed up the other day that I sent this letter to our Prime Minister. It's basically an op-ed. It says, hey, Prime Minister Harper, before you let any more refugees or immigrants into Canada, here's an unusual idea. Why not make sure that all Canadians are taken care of? Take care of our homeless, take care of our hungry, take care of our poor, take care of the sick, take care of our senior citizens. Bring back the jobs that have been outsourced and taken away from Canadians. It's time that Canadians take back Canada and abolish the over-politically correct attitude that we've been forced into becoming. No one asked me if I wanted to be politically correct, and I'm certain that no other Canadian was asked either. It's time Canada says, enough is enough. The international free ride is over. No more immigration or refugees into Canada until all Canadians are taken care of first. It is Canadians who should vote on the immigration policies and should not be left up to politicians who only have one goal, to win votes, by whatever means possible, including allowing immigrants and refugees into Canada. For those who have been fortunate enough to get into our great country, if you don't like our traditions, our way of living, our great history, our rich culture, if you don't agree with having the Bible in our schools, sing Merry Christmas, celebrating Easter, nativity scenes at Christmas, Christmas trees, or any of, the, of our other long traditions, just remember, where your plane landed, it can take you back from where you came. Just my thoughts, Mr. Prime Minister. Have a good day. Well, that's, that's very good. Um, the, uh, the big trick is, so what does everybody do with the refugees? And the only countries to have enough of a conscience to really be, um, to want to be generous and charitable about this are the countries of the European Union. Even the United States made a big concession, taking in 10,000 refugees. Well, we could also be held responsible for this for a certain extent because we broke it in, in Iraq. Um, we destroyed the system in Iraq, but there's another thing to be aware of. Um, you know that four years ago, I suddenly had a revelation, and I tried. You know that my second book, Global Brain, the yes. Office of the Secretary of Defense in 2010, through a forum based on that book, and brought mm-hmm. in people from the State Department, the Energy Department, DARPA, IBM, and MIT. So four years ago, I had this bright insight. Maybe it was three years ago. And I wanted to get through to the Obama administration, so I called the person who had arranged the State Department uh, or the Defense Department event, and said, who do we know that's close to the White House? And he gave me a Democratic Party operative who's been very involved in foreign affairs, um, for example, in, in the Iraq situation uh, for the last 20 years. And I called him and said, look, we've got it all wrong in Syria. Saddam Hussein is not our enemy. Um, I mean, uh, Bashar Assad. Yeah. Bashar Assad is not our enemy there. Bashar Assad is stability, and stability is our friend in Syria. We've got to start supporting Bashar Assad, and we've got to start working with, and this will almost make even me gag, we've got to start working with countries that we hate. We've got to start working with Iran, with Russia, and with China um, against ISIS, because ISIS is our real enemy. ISIS threatens China because China has its far western province, the Xinjiang province, which Muslims call East Turkmenistan, and which Muslim radicals want for their very own. Um, Russia has huge problems with Chechnya, Dagestan, um, all Azerbaijan, all of the southern republics, which are formerly parts of the Persian Empire, of all things. Therefore, they are Muslim. And there are Muslim groups, Muslim terrorist groups, in the mountains of those territories that want to topple the Soviet Union. So Russia has something to fear from these people. China has something to fear from these people. And ISIS wants to lead all of those Muslim jihadists um, in Central Asia, just below Russia, and in China. So we share a common interest with them. ISIS is the real enemy, and until we've gotten rid of ISIS, all of us should unite, and we should keep um, Bashar Assad in power. Why? Because we should have learned a lesson by now from toppling Saddam Hussein. We toppled Saddam Hussein, we created a power vacuum, and in that power vacuum leapt ISIS. That's how ISIS came to be. No more power vacuums. Dictators are better than than chaos. 
uh, dictators are better than ISIS. Uh, I, when I finished giving my little speech, um, the, uh, the operative that I was talking to said, you know, we're beginning to think that way. Um, but one thing that we haven't done is embrace um, Bashar Assad. Now, he shouldn't be embraced too heavily. He's a monster. Um, but he is providing stability in his country. And if you watch the interviews on Al Jazeera with the refugees, you will see that in two nations in the Middle East, education was highly prized. And kids were given a very, very good education. And those two countries that raised um, Muslim kids to be modernists, to be secularists, and to be, in a certain degree, pluralist, a certain degree, not to the mm. nth degree. But those two countries were Iraq and Syria. And uh, we should prize what's, what little is left of authority in those two countries because it's authority that gives you the safety to be able to go down to the local market and buy a bag of pita without fearing that you're going to be the next victim of a car bomb. But, but isn't Russia putting in military assets and troops into Syria? Yes, as of, not troops, not yet. Um, they have a, a tiny number of what we would call trainers and advisors in there to train people on how to use the weapons that they've provided. They've been providing uh, weapons to Syria, I believe, for something like 50 years now. And um, and they are, the, the word has it that they're about to provide tanks mm -hmm. as of today. Um, but they don't have a significant number of troops in there yet. Yeah. Nonetheless, Russia, we have NATO. And as far as Russia is concerned, and we have ignored this, you and I haven't ignored this. On this show, you and I have alluded to this many times. Russia has its own, in its eyes, its own equivalent to NATO. Yeah. And that equivalent to NATO includes China, Russia, Iran, and Syria. So when we threaten Syria, when anybody threatens Syria, it is threatening uh, a part of a strategic alliance with Russia that is as important to Russia as Turkey, uh, we should talk about Turkey in a minute, as Turkey is or France is, to the United States, because both those countries, Turkey and France, are a part of NATO. So we really do have an old, uh, the, the kind of power structure that was arrayed just before World War I, two great big alliances that whose alliances can be tripwires that can produce a world war, so we have to be careful. And plus we've seen Russia and China getting very close. You know, Putin was well, at... Russia and China... Yeah. China has been buying uh, its most advanced weapons from Russia for a long time, but you know how China buys weapons. It buys them, then it takes them apart, and it retro-engineers retro them. Yeah. And that's what it has been doing for a long time. But there is a lot of military back and forth between China and Russia, and both of them are supporters of Iran. Now, Russia is a formal supporter of Iran. China is more of a trade supporter of Iran, and I don't know if China has a formal strategic agreement with Iran. But one way or the other, the Russians regarded as if the Chinese do have a formal um, military agreement with Iran. And Iran, um, Syria has been Iran's little brother. It's been Iran's puppet. Um, Bashir Assad has been uh, uh, one of the assets of, the, um, uh, uh, of Iran for a long time. So when Saudi Arabia decided to take advantage of the Arab Spring and start an alleged civil war in Saudi in Syria. Mm -hmm. It was to pry a major asset away from Iran before Iran could grab the whole bag of marbles in the Middle East. What's your what's your opinion on the Iranian nuclear deal? I think it's wretched, I think it's ghastly, I think it's horrible. I think that those who have been telling us what's in it Mm -hmm. um, that is, the people in the administration who have been telling us what's in it have been lying to us. Um, if you look carefully at the agreement, I think the word inspect uh, or variations of that word, like inspection, only appear seven times in the entire deal. There's another word, access, and it appears about a dozen times in the deal. The agreement, if I read it correctly, only gives us access to three declared nuclear sites and does not give us the right to inspect undeclared mm -hmm. sites. If we suspect that there's a military site, we've said something to the effect that we get instant access. No, we don't get instant access. We go through a process of elaborate paperwork where we submit the request to inspect if that's what we want to do. The Iranians get a bunch of days to sit on their heels 
and propose another, quote, solution to the problem, unquote. And then it goes through a whole bunch of councils on which we're represented, on which Iran is represented, to decide what to do with our request and with the Iranian counterproposal. But it doesn't really specify a right to inspection or a right to access of other suspected sites. And out of those three sites, we only knew of two until approximately two years ago. One of them was top secret, and we didn't suspect it was there until about two years ago. So how many other secret sites are there likely to be in Iran? Um, probably quite a few. And we don't have a right to access for them. Now, the only, the only calming thing about the deal is that um, about three weeks after the deal came out, um, Israeli newspapers began to speak as if this deal actually would keep Iran's nuclear program in check for 10 years. And they focused on what would happen after the 10 years were over. Well, that's a degree of confidence in this deal that I don't have, because yeah. looking at the deal, I don't see the snapback provisions and other tough and instant measures that the White House has sold us on. I don't see them in the deal at all. Not I, at all. I can't understand what this deal presents besides giving back to uh, Iran 100 what is it 100 billion dollars as well as lifting 150, up the 150 billion as well as lifting um, the embargoes like why what was what yeah, was what uh, well, was the a, logic behind it there is a woman named let's see if i can remember her name uh Hillary Leverett Manning there is something that one of the Jewish magazines tablet calls the Iran lobby, and uh, they give uh, credit to, for leading it to treat a Parsi. And the Iran lobby, they feel, has absolutely won, has won very big time. And if you hear Hillary Leverett Manning speak, she will tell you about the fact that if, if the United States makes up and kisses with Iran, the world will suddenly have a flourishing of peace unlike anything this planet has ever seen before. Now, it's a nice dream. We would all have to like, like to have a flourishing of peace, sure. unlike anything this earth has ever seen before. But, it's not but Iran happen. is an is an aggressive nation. Yeah. The, its aggression is built into its constitution. I've told you this before, but it's been a long time, so we'll do it again. In the early days of arguments over the Iranian constitution, there was a revolution in 1979. The secularists, the pluralists, the modernists were sure they had won it. And then the Ayatollah came flying back from France. No one ever suspected that this strange-looking man with a strange name, Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini, could ever take over the revolution that so clearly the secularists had won. But guess who took over? And when there were debates about the nature of the Iranian, the new Iranian constitution in 1979 when the Shah was toppled, um, the, the, there were many from the secularist side who said, well, we have been the victims of imperialist oppression. So we should stand on behalf of liberation from imperialist oppression everywhere in the world and should support other nations that are trying to achieve their freedom. And the Ruhollah Khomeini, the Ayatollah Khomeini boy, said, no, not so fast. Um, the, the Islam is dominant over all other religions on the earth. What we want is a worldwide Islamic revolution in which our form of Islamic revolution here in Iran will dominate all over the world. So that's what's written into the Iranian constitution. The goal of a global uh, Sharia-based um, state like the, built like the state of Iran with, with religious bullies who go through the streets um, beating you if they think that too much of your face is showing um, or that you're, you're, you're doing something that they consider to be un-Islamic with holy bullies who break up political rallies when they're political rallies for the opposition, with holy bullies all over the place, and with uh, religious police who have the right to break into your home if they think something is un-Islamic un is going on in your home. That's what Iran's constitution says should be spread all over the world. And uh, people who respond to statements like mm -hmm. this, when I make them, you know, I have a weekly podcast, yeah. Tower of the Among Us, on YouTube. And um, people who respond to that podcast say, yeah, but let's look at who's really been invading other countries. Look at the United States and Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're right. But then they make a statement that's utterly and completely wrong. And who has Iran invaded, they say? Well... According to uh, Brigadier General Qasem Soleimani, who runs their overseas or their their uh, foreign expeditionary force, uh, the Quds Brigade, in other words, who runs proxy armies wherever he can develop proxy army, 
Iran, according to him, um, he has got Lebanon under his control. He's got Iraq under his control. He's got Yemen under his control now. He's got Gaza under his control. And he's planning to take a lot more. So those people who are fooled by the fact that the Iranians crawl under the sheets and then move to the other side of the bed, your side of the bed, and knock you off, um, instead of crawling across the top of the sheets, mm -hmm. just because they're under the sheets, these people are fooled into thinking they don't exist. Howard, and Stan they're wrong. Howard, stand by, my friend. You and I have to take a brief break at the bottom for the news. Howard Bloom is my special guest. He is the author of The Mohammed Code. His website, www.howardbloom.net. I'll be back on the other side of this break with Howard Bloom as we continue talking about the news of the day and how it affects one and all here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Cancer Foundation is a new nonprofit foundation that focuses on a holistic approach to cancer that includes physical, mental, spiritual, and political aspects. Cancer education, research, and care are provided for all types of cancer patients. You can listen to interviews with cancer doctors and survivors and read research on holistic aspects of cancer at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. That's www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes... The Holistic Cancer Foundation is a new nonprofit foundation that focuses on a holistic approach to cancer that includes physical, mental, spiritual, and political aspects. Cancer education, research, and care are provided for all types of cancer patients. You can listen to interviews with cancer doctors and survivors and read research on holistic aspects of cancer at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. That's www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com
Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. Thank you very much, Craig, for letting me know that we're back on the main feeds, and that's why we had a little bit of a hiccup, because we went from satellite back to main Trump line here. Trunk line. Trump. Ha! He's on my mind today. Uh, did you watch the um, the show from Dallas tonight? No, I haven't. And the headlines say that uh, Trump had a crowd of 20,000, but that he had absolutely no policy ideas. What, what did you get to see it? No, I didn't. I was on air. In fact, uh, 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 but I but I am going to be taping Wednesday's uh, debate from the Reagan Library. Well, that's that's a, I, I, you know, I do coast to coast. Yeah. Um, fairly often, and they asked me to cover the last debate. Mm -hmm. So I watched that debate from beginning to end using the pause function on my DVR and taking copious notes. And uh, Donald Trump was remarkable in the way that he held the stage. Yeah. Um, he is remarkable in his degree of utter and complete self-confidence, and he's gotten apparently very good training in ad-libbing um, from his reality television experience because he's always got something at the tip of his tongue. Now, sometimes it's something foul and obnoxious. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's something that's not even true. But one way or the other, he delivers it in a way that's very convincing. And what's most convincing is that we, whether we have been apologizing to the rest of the world or not, under Barack Obama, we feel as if we have been mm -hmm. in the United States. And uh, Trump apologizes to nobody for nothing. There's only one small problem with Donald Trump. What's that? The question he was asked by, by Megan, uh, uh, or whatever her name is, the, the reporter right. for Fox TV, um, her question was thoroughly legitimate. And her question was, um, you asked the country to trust you with our economy, mm -hmm. but you have gone bankrupt four times. How can this country put its economics in the hands of a man who has gone bankrupt four times? And no one has paid attention to the question, and no one has paid attention to the answer. And the answer was, well, Megan, you know, these people that I stiffed, these people I never paid back, these people I borrowed money from, they weren't nice people. They were killers. Um, so here, Donald Trump is telling you, imagine the day on which Donald Trump went to these people who lent him the money for these four enterprises that went bankrupt mm -hmm. in order to borrow the money. Do you think he went to their face and said, you're a killer, you're a nasty guy, but I'm going to ask you for uh, $100 million? Yeah, yeah, no, he would say, he, he, didn't. he would say, you're the most magnificent, wonderful person in the world. You know how much I love you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go into this project. We're both going to win big time. I'm going to make you look really good. That's what Donald Trump but, would have said. But in the so, world of reality, where business is business and it's dog eat dog, many other companies do the same thing that Donald Trump did. It, it, I it's, it's, it's on they a daily do it in basis. The construction. They do it in the construction business where we're rising very high and then crashing very fast. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of life, and you yeah. come back from it. But if Donald Trump is going to say that about the people he went to for money, the people he must have flattered more than anybody else on the face of planet Earth, what is he going to say about you or me someday, especially me because I'm an American citizen? Mm -hmm. But what would he say about you too? But you know what? He would I, say, I, uh, he, he's justifying his unjustifiable behavior by instead of saying, okay, I made a mistake here. Yes, I'm not infallible. Mm -hmm. um, instead of saying that and taking responsibility, he's putting responsibility on other people and making them look like the villains when, in fact, he was the one who failed. And he's showing a lack of moral compunction. And a man I, who turns like that, that on the people who feed him, he's going to turn on you and me. I, I don't know. He will... I'm... I was just going to say, Howard, I, I don't know if that means that he's a villain. He's shrewd. There's no two ways about that. And I think that this is what, hell, I'll tell you something, Howard. If we had somebody yeah. with, the, with with Donald Trump's well, kahunis up here in yeah. Canada, I would do everything in my power to get behind this guy because people are fed up with politicians. People want... Donald Trump is saying what everybody's been thinking. And there's a headline uh, today. In fact, it came out in the last hour or so, which is Republican Party implodes, Dems in denial. And what the story is really about is the mm -hmm. fact that the Republican establishment picked its candidate, Jeb Bush. 
And the Bush family does what the Bush family has always done. It managed to amass unbelievable amounts of money, and Lord knows what kind of favors it mm-hmm. owes in, in, in return for that money. So the Republican Party thought it knew who its candidate was, and then Donald Trump came along. And he's totally out of the control of the normal people who control the Republican Party. The same thing has happened with the Democratic Party. The leaders of the Democratic Party thought they knew who their next leader was going to be. It was going to be Hillary Clinton. And along comes Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders has pulled ahead of Hillary Clinton, I believe, in both uh, uh, Idaho and New Hampshire. Um, And and is getting tremendous crowds. He's getting Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are getting equal sized crowds, 20,000. And you know what? Surprising and... Yeah, I'm. I'm telling you, I, I'm sorry. I I think Donald Trump is what politics needs today. You see, Donald I'm Trump. Donald Donald Trump doesn't doesn't do everything behind the curtain. He lets you know where he that's stands. True. Well, sort of. Um, how he's going to pull off this business of building a uh, 1,100 mile uh, wall like the China the Wall, Great Wall mm-hmm. of China on American southern border, or like Hadrian's Wall, um, in Scot- separating Scotland from Britain, how he's going to pull that off, Lord alone knows, how he's going to make the Mexican government pay for it, I really don't know at all. He doesn't seem to realize that um, America owes its vigor, its economic vigor these days, to Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. And more than 50% of the businesses of Silicon Valley have been started by, guess who? Immigrants. Immigrants. Yeah. Think of Google. Um, Sergey Brin is from Russia. He's a right. refugee from Russia. Um, think of uh, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft is run right now by a, a president from India. Think of the most extraordinary company in, in the last 50 years of American industrial history. Um, SpaceX and Tesla Motors. Right. Elon Musk. Elon Musk is an immigrant from South Africa. Um, well, maybe, well maybe, it's, maybe it's about time that America takes back America and puts Americans at the, at the helm of these companies. If we do, our companies are going to go down the tubes because Why? these are some of the brightest and most – because these are some of the brightest, most creative, and most aggressive people on the face of the earth. What? There's, no, there's, no, aggra- there's no aggressive, creative people in America? If Americans were more all that creative and aggressive – they would have founded Tesla Motors. They would have founded SpaceX. But we haven't. And our great gift is our ability to bring in some of the brightest people on the face of the earth and let them do their thing in ways that they never would in their own home country, but in ways they cost? would never be allowed. But at what cost? Well, I, don't, I think the cost, it's not cost, it's benefit. The benefit is huge. If we, we have allowed our space program to drift into the hands mm-hmm. of Americans, people like Richard Shelby, the mm-hmm. senator from Alabama, Richard Shelby runs a little cabal of people in the Senate and the Congress who've been killing our space program. Nobody seems to notice it, but Americans have not had access to space on American-made vehicles since 2011 when Congress grounded the space shuttle. Um, the, the money, we're, we're pouring a lot of money into the NASA budget. It's mm-hmm. approximately $17 billion a year. That's a reasonably substantial amount of money. Well, not compared the to the $150 billion that the U.S. is giving to Iran. Well, that's quite true, but nonetheless, it is uh, enough money to accomplish something. So why aren't we accomplishing anything? Why can't we get Americans into space on American vehicles? Why do we have to get every single astronaut that we put in the International Space Station to the space station on Russian vehicles, Soyuz rockets? Why do we have to pay the Russians between $72 million and $76 million per seat, or a total of $4 billion dollars? taken out of our space industry Mm -hmm. and shoveled into Russia's space industry because American politicians are in control here and American politicians are killing America's space program. They're insisting on a rocket called the Space Launch System and they're doing tremendous amounts of publicity for it that is leftover technology from the shuttle. It's 50 and 60 year old technology. It is so expensive. The rocket will be too expensive to fly. If it does fly, it will not be safe. You wouldn't want to be a human um, launched on that rocket. And the reason they're trying, they're trying to delay SpaceX and Boeing, which has mm-hmm. a, a, a capsule called the CST-100, those two capsules, the, the Dragon capsule from SpaceX, was supposed to be ready this year. 
Um, the CST 100 from Boeing was supposed to be ready this year. Another uh, a plane that looks very similar to the space shuttle right. called the Dream Chaser from a company called Sierra Nevada was also supposed to be ready this year. Why are they not ready this year? Because Congress has systematically taken the money away from the program, and it's a relatively small program by NASA standards, and it's stolen that money from the program that would have allowed these companies to have Americans traveling to the International Space Station on American vehicles this year, and it's taken that money and it's put it into the rocket that's too expensive to fly, this giant Franken rocket, this rocket made of antique parts. Why? Because Richard Shelby wants to maintain jobs in his district and wants to maintain Alabama's leadership in space. And he's got a bunch of other senators and congressmen, especially from Colorado, who also want to support the space industry and jobs in their neighborhood. And they don't care how backward the technology is. And they don't care how expensive it is. Meanwhile, Elon Musk is putting up rockets for um, between a third and a tenth the cost of what um, the the traditional military space industrial complex companies are charging for similar launches. It's about one fifth at this point. Well, then That's how come all this how this in cost. then how come all this money is going to NASA for uh, research into Mars? Well, fortunately, these the this cabal of senators and congressmen, mm-hmm. this ghastly little cabal that is killing America's manned space access is only functioning. It's only focusing on the manned space program, which it is killing. It is not focusing on the NASA science program, which continues to be utterly and fantastically brilliant. But you know, maybe you don't. I mean, I haven't told you, but I'm co-designing a multi-planetary mission Mm -hmm. uh, at Caltech. Yeah, you told us last time you were with us. Yeah, and what we're designing is a system so much less expensive than any of the systems that have been used for planetary science to date that it's going to be ridiculous if we manage to get it through. What's that? Who do you have to pass it through in order to make it happen? Well, at this point, uh, it's taken us, uh, we're about a year and a half into this project. Mm -hmm. I've finished a brochure. Uh, We have two artists who've been doing the now that in the hands of NASA's Jeff Propulsion Lab, and mm-hmm. they have to approve it for public release. Can you hear me? Because we're breaking up. A yeah, bit. no, I, I hear you fine. So, if it's okay. got nothing to do with NASA, or is NASA part of this project? The question is, we are breaking up. Okay, I was asking if is NASA part of this project? How we have to go through NASA. So it's first. Approval of the uh, making public our work. Mm-hmm. Howard, um, but NASA is not the problem. What uh, is? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can. What is the problem? Now, the problem is not NASA at all. I mean, we we have to go through the standard approval processes for NASA, and that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. But but these congressmen and senators have sh- shoved a program down NASA's throat that NASA doesn't want. And Charles Bolden, there were a bunch of stories that just came out in the last three weeks. Uh, the it, the um, uh, Houston Chronicle had one of them. Uh, Charles Bolden had an opinion piece in Wired, mm-hmm. and there was a third. And they all say, Congress, give us a break. Stop destroying America's space program. Uh, one of them headlined his article. This was uh, Phil Flam, I think, or Phil uh, Platt, who is the, uh, the, archi- or, or the astronomy uh, reporter for Slate magazine said something like five reasons to be outraged at at, at, um, uh, at Congress right now. And what Bolden says, we don't want this monster rocket to shoving down our throats. Just give us enough money yeah. for the program called Commercial Crew, which is a small amount of money by NASA standards. Give us enough money. Fully fund us. You've been stealing two-thirds of our funding every single year for the last five years. That's why we're running late on this program. Just fully fund us, and we will have you in space again on American vehicles in 2017. If you want to wait for this monster rocket, the Franken rocket, the space launch system, people in the, in the space industry call it the Senate launch system because it was designed by the Senate, not by engineers, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to wait until 2022. If then, and even then, the rocket will be unsafe to fly. Now, are you, too expensive okay, you're, you're coming to an election year, 2016. Right. Have, right. Has, have the 
Have the candidates on both sides been made aware of this? Could this not be a part of a, 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 a uh, an election bid where, you know, look, get America back into space. America, this, this Senate approved system that is so dangerous is costing so much money and yet others can do it for the less money with greater safety, putting America back in space by 2017. You're absolutely right. This should be a campaign issue. But and only one candidate has really shown a strong interest in this. It's Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton uh, has, uh, as part of her camp, Mm -hmm. um, she has uh, a woman named Lori Garver. Lori Garver is the former head of the National Space Society. She is the former deputy administrator of NASA. She is highly, highly regarded in the space community. She is well aware of this problem. She fought it during her entire time at NASA. How come we don't and, hear about it? Um, because apparently the American public is exhausted on the subject of space. If there's a race and we're not winning, then uh, America loses interest in the sport. And, um, and this is a race that we're not winning. And we can win it. We're still ahead of everybody else in technology. There is another little tiny problem here, and it's that... Um, that the military puts all of its high high security satellites, top mm -hmm. secret satellites, very complex, very expensive satellites into orbit using a company called United Launch Alliance. United Launch Alliance is a, uh, a partnership between uh, Northrop Grumman and Boeing, and it gets a billion dollars a year in a flat out subsidy from the government. There, but there, and, and it launches rockets with traditional American names, names you will recognize from the American space program of the 1960s, the Atlas and the Delta rockets. Oh, sure, but, yeah. Rob, there is one small problem no one is telling you about. Guess where the engines for the Atlas and the Delta rockets come from? Russia. Russia. So not only were we pouring $4 billion mm -hmm. into Russia's space program in order to get our astronauts into space, we are pouring additional billions of dollars to get our most top secret satellites into space. But how much and is it saving? That, that ends. How much is it saving us? Uh, it's uh, well, it's only saving us if you operate on the assumption that mm -hmm. Americans are not capable of making a rocket as powerful or as safe as the Russian rocket. Um, otherwise, I mean, we have to develop our own space industries. We have to stay ahead of the world. And we've taken that money out of research and development in the United States, and we put it elsewhere. Now, fortunately, there's a guy named Jeff Bezos who started a little company called Amazon.com, and he has a rocket company. Mm -hmm. And hit the United Launch Alliance, realizing that they're going to have to get away from Russian rockets, that the government's, that the military is not going to tolerate this anymore, have worked out a deal with Jeff Bezos to use one of his engines, which should be ready in about two to three years. It's an entirely different engine, and they're going to use his engines. But meantime, in the Sneaky Moves department, a company called Rocketdyne, it's one of the companies up in the Colorado, Utah area that manages to manipulate congressmen and senators to its own interest, Rocketdyne has just made a $2 billion bid for United Launch Alliance, this company that lost all of our sensitive military satellites. And if it manages to gain possession, then Jeff Bezos will be aced out of the picture and Rocketdyne, a company that's already demonstrated that it's really not cutting it in competition with, with Russian rockets, will have a total monopoly on these launches. And we need many providers in order to make sure we get the best deal and we get the best technology. But what, like, let me get back to my question before. How much money is being saved by using the Russian already built engine and putting it into the Atlas and into the the um, the Delta? Well, well, let me put it like this: the money is not being saved by the American government because the American government is being uh, charged a, a very high rate by United mm -hmm. Launch Alliance. Any money that's going that's being saved is being saved for the stockholders. Um, of United Launch Alliance, which means the stockholders of Boeing and the stockholders of, of Northrop Grumman. Um, the, so it's not, I don't think it's benefiting the United States. I mean, you know, this was a free trade argument originally when the decision was made. Mm -hmm. If the Russians can make better engines than we can, and if they can make them cheaper, then let's save money and buy Russian engines. Right. But when you save money that way, 
and you don't have a competition between your own rocket engine companies, um, you, you start skimping on research and development, and you skimp on the ability to feel your way into the next generation of technology. And that's a right we've given up. Um, if, if it weren't for Jeff Bezos, um, we wouldn't, and Jeff Bezos, and of course Elon Musk, who's making next generation engines at, at a much lower cost by using next generation technologies like 3D printing. You know, I think I've explained at one point in the past, but casting a rocket engine can take six months um, using traditional methods, and it has can have flaws. Um, casting a rocket engine or building a rocket engine using a 3D printer takes a third of the time and is far less expensive, and the, uh, the material integrity mm-hmm. of the engine that is made by a 3D printer is much greater than the material integrity of a rocket engine made the old way. So sometimes cheaper can be better if you're getting cheaper because you've moved on to a new generation of both technology and manufacturing expertise. And that's what America needs to do. Elon Musk is doing it. Jeff Bezos is showing signs of doing it. Even uh, There's even a possibility that Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic is doing right. it because there was just an announcement today that Virgin Galactic is beefing up the power of its uh, rockets after a disaster. But remember, every single company on the face of the Earth and every single country that's launched satellites into space has had many blow-ups on of the course. way to finally getting a reliable yeah. rocket. You know, the, the, the path to success is filled with failure. Yeah. yeah. And you learn, the big trick is you learn from every failure. You Bingo. learn from every failure. And Elon Musk is brilliant at that. Absolutely brilliant at that. So we are lucky to have Elon Musk. Uh, and, and we're and we're lucky to have the, the the Indian guy who's running Microsoft right now, who seems to be turning the image of Microsoft around. Windows 10 has got far better word of mouth on the street than I mean, Windows 8 was a disaster. Well, it couldn't um, get any very much worse. Anyway, Howard, I hate to say this, my friend, but we're out of time for tonight. Always great well, having Robert, you on the it's show. It's a pleasure. Sir, it, it is a pleasure being with you. The pleasure is all mine, my friend. Uh, so until the next time you and I meet back here in the Exxon, take care of yourself, Howard, and keep those push-ups coming. <laughs> Have a good night, Rob. Take care, buddy. Exxon Nation, that Bye. was Howard Bloom, www.howardbloom.net. He is the author of The Muhammad Code. I'll be back tomorrow night at uh, 8 o'clock.